Come in. Ah, coffee. Thanks, Lou. That's just what I need. How did that last scene go? Mm. Rough. The whole day's been rough. You know, I sometimes think I'd have been better off if I stayed on as an acrobat. Well, you got two days off anyway. Mm -hmm. Not quite. I'm going to be making a movie. You're already making a movie. Tell me something, Lou. When did you start smoking? Oh, about 12, 13. Me too. I used to pick up butts from the street. And after a while, I got to smoke whole ones. <laughs> In those days, we used to say it cuts down on your wind or stunts your growth. But nowadays, they know a lot more about it. I guess they are pretty bad for you. According to the script, they can kill you. This is the Public Health Service quarantine station at San Pedro, about 25 miles south of Los Angeles. The man in the stern of the boat is Dr. Don Sinclair, medical officer in charge. Doctor, can you tell us what you're up to out there? We're going out to board a freighter in the harbor, Bert. She's ready to dock at berth 228, but we've got a case of suspected communicable disease on board. And what happens if you find the disease? We'll quarantine the man before they dock, and this way we can keep the disease out of the country. It's an endless fight against cholera, smallpox, plague, yellow fever, and many other diseases. The task of public health is not only to prevent disease, but to conquer it. The doctors go right to where the disease is, to a coal mine in Beckley, West Virginia, say. This test is being run at the Beckley Appalachian Hospital by Dr. Donald Rasmussen. Mr. Simpson is a coal miner, Bert. Uh, we're measuring his uh, heart and lung activity while he's exercising. Now, this is part of a study of lung disease in coal miners. Uh, we're finding out how working in a mine affects a man's lungs. These people in public health are really a serious bunch. They don't monkey around. They're concerned with public health problems. And today, they've got themselves a whopper. It's called smoking. Cigarette smoking. Advertising has always plugged the pleasures of smoking. But it's not much of a pleasure that'll cause several hundred thousand premature deaths this year. Who says that? Not much of a pleasure when a cigarette smoker has twice the risk of a non-smoker of death from a heart attack. Now, wait a minute or when the risk of death from all causes is 70% higher for cigarette smokers than for non-smokers. No kidding. No kidding. It turns out that cigarette smoking is one of the great health hazards of the 20th century. Where do you get all this stuff? From him, Dr. Luther L. Terry. He was a Surgeon General in 1964 when the Public Health Service published a book that put the finger on smoking. Dr. Terry, why did you get that book out? I didn't get it out myself, Bert. We printed it and we endorse it. But it's the work of hundreds of health people all across the world. Let me show you the book. Smoking and Health, Report of the Advisory Committee to the Surgeon General of the Public Health Service. It's written in a flat federal way, but still it's quite a shock to read. The public health people thought it would be a bombshell when it came out. So did the people running all our communications. Everybody began to tell the story, and it seemed to be getting through. Fifteen million people tried to stop smoking. Some could, some couldn't. They call it an habituation, but it can lead to a slew of other diseases. Heart disease, bronchitis, cancer, peptic ulcer, emphysema. Those are the main ones. Psychologists say that people smoke for different reasons, but that most of them are really looking for some kind of gratification. They don't always find it. This is Charlie Johnson, one of the millions of Americans that the Surgeon General didn't get through to in 1964. Gee, I was only 14, Bert, but I didn't read the papers much. Yet you were smoking. Oh, sure, since I was 12. But I was a very light smoker to begin with. Mm, two a week. Two packs? No, two cigarettes. I see. Well, we'd like to use you as a symbol of the 4,000 new smokers who begin to smoke each day the Surgeon General's report doesn't get through. Well, I don't want you to think I'm dumb, Bert. I mean, I, I heard about the report when it first came out. But you didn't read it. No, I'm too busy with my schoolwork. Have you uh, ever given it much thought? Mm-mm. But I hear about a lot of things I don't give much thought to. 
Well, maybe when I get old and square, I'll, uh, well, you know, get reflective. But who reflects at Louie's drive-in? I do. Yeah, but he's not interested in you. You don't smoke. Oh, this is my friend Pete McCabe. He's a non-smoker, as they say. Have you read the Surgeon General's report, Pete? No, but I read a lot about it. You think the report had any effect on you? I'm not sure, maybe. All I know is that when I started smoking, it made my eyes water and I hated the taste, so I bagged it. I'd like uh, six Superbo burgers, uh, six chocolate shakes, and uh, six orders of French fries, and six orders of onion rings, and six glasses of water. Will that be all? Oh no, that'll hold us for the first time around. Maybe we'll order something to go. In order to get the disease, you have to take up smoking. And then you have to be persuaded to kick the habit so you won't get the disease. Oh, hi, Bert. Uh, I'm just here with my uh, peer group. This is Judy Wyatt. Hi. Oh, and Buddy Serkin. Hi, Bert. Hi. And this is Jean Ross. Hi, Bert. And Martha Breen. Hi. Oh, and you already met Pete McCabe. Hiya. Charlie, two quick questions before you're off again. Sure. Why do you smoke? Well, uh, let me see. I'd say uh, I smoke because, well, because all my friends smoke. You know, I like to swing with a peer group. Not all of them. Well, most of them. More than half? Half is the national figure for high school seniors. I guess we're two-thirds, then. Do you enjoy it? Oh, sure I do. Well, anyway, yeah, most of the time. Judy? It's not so much that I enjoy it, but... Well, smoking makes me feel older than I am. I don't like people thinking I'm just a little kid. Jean, how come you're not smoking? I tried it last year. Out of curiosity, I guess. But then I just quit. You read something in the paper? No, that's how it made me quit. I thought it was just a messy habit that made my room smell. The thing I don't like is everybody telling us what to do about it. Preaching. How can I preach when I don't know the answer? All I do know is that in spite of the report, half the kids in the country are smoking by the time they're 18. The other half are like Pete. Listen, don't make a hero out of me. If it didn't make my eyes water, I bet I'd smoke like a chimney. How do you know? You never saw anybody like me for conformity. Did those doctors really say cigarettes could cut 20 years off my life? They could. But a runaway truck could cut 60 years off it. The public health people are against runaway trucks, too. <laughs> I suppose I uh, shouldn't be a wise guy about this, but were you trying to uh, get me to give up cigarettes because of, of something that might happen later? You want to try to get me to see myself as, as an old man, or even a sick old man? I can't do it, Bert. It's easier to understand my friends. See? A thick book written back in Washington is not as influential as a circle of good friends. But Charlie Johnston's friends aren't the only people who set the smoking example. Young people spend a lot of time rebelling against the adult world. They also spend a lot of time copying it. Here's Herbert Blagden, Charlie's teacher over at Fremont High. What's your impression of Charlie Johnson, Herb? Well, I'd give Charlie the highest kind of rating. He's a bright boy, understands what he's read, he performs well here in the lab. Why do you think Charlie smokes? Well, I don't know. I, I haven't given it much thought, Bert. I guess he gets a little uh, upset from time to time, and smoking calms his nerves. Lord knows that's why I do it. You notice any difference between the smokers and the non-smokers in the class? Well, kids who smoke generally are a little anxious to get out. Out of school? No, no, out of class for a cigarette. And they, uh, they may not always do quite as well in their work either. But not Charlie, of course. How do you handle this in your teaching? Uh, what I mean is, uh, well, uh, do you ever discuss smoking in class with them from a scientific standpoint? Yes, we do. It's our job to warn them. Students did run an anti-smoking campaign here a couple years ago, about the time of the Surgeon General's report. Was it successful? No. Well, some of them got excited about it at the time, but it sort of died out. Well, what about you yourself? Do you think smoking is dangerous? Yes, I do. I'm convinced it is. I'd like to stop, but every time I do, I climb the walls for a couple of weeks, and then I start again.
People are always talking about the powerful influence of the home. They're right. Sounds mighty rough, eh? And getting rougher every day. Yeah, she's no good under 40 miles an hour. You know what's the matter? Well, Buddy took a look at it. And he says that the rings are so bad that the oil's backing up into the cylinders and fouling the plugs. Hmm. Then it's not the distributor. No. No, the timing's all right. It's just the block is in bad shape. I see. And uh, now we start the negotiations for the cost of a ring job, eh? 60 bucks. Can you help me? Okay, I'll split it with you. 30 bucks from me, 30 from you. Fair enough? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, but could you lend me the whole thing and, and I'll pay you back 30? How soon? Well, um, let's see. Four more Saturdays at the supermarket and I can... Uh, why don't you give up smoking? Then you could pay me back faster. I knew that was coming. Charlie, Pete McCabe's on the phone, and Judy called about five minutes ago. Okay, Mom. What's the matter with your... I noticed you kid with Charlie about his smoking. Do you take it seriously yourself? Oh, indeed I do. I've read quite a bit about the danger of it. But, uh, well, I just don't seem to be able to get through to Charlie. Why not? I don't quite understand it myself. Um, I think I get along well with Charlie. My boy respects me, and he likes me. Just doesn't listen to me, that's all. I sometimes think that if I could quit, then he would. You see, uh, we've made a kind of smoky world for him, and it's tough for him to get out alone. What does today's smart smoker look for in a cigarette? Yeah. He looks for the right tobacco. Yeah, I just he talked with him. Right we worked out a good deal. He looks for the right length. He's going to give me the, the 60 bucks for a ring job, and uh, length I'll pay him back half. In the new Double Super King, you get that length. Length that makes any ordinary king-size cigarette look like, well, sure an ordinary cigarette. Out. Super yeah. King gives you all you could ask yeah. for in a smoke. Charlie Johnson may not have read the Surgeon General's report, but a lot of other people have, and they're concerned. One of these people is Maureen Newberger the former senator from Oregon. She sympathizes with those who earn a living in tobacco, but she also believes that we must get through to Charlie Johnson. It's my feeling, Bert, that if spinach were giving us as much trouble as tobacco, we'd ban it in a minute. But the Surgeon General's report happens to deal with our largest crop from a tax standpoint. That means it's not going to be easy to change, or at least that you won't be getting so much pressure to change from tobacco companies or their ad agencies or the magazines or the TV networks. Pressure has to come from other directions. From where? Well, eventually from Charlie Johnson himself. That's why Senator Magnuson and I joined to sponsor legislation to put this little notice on every pack of cigarettes. We're worried about young smokers like Charlie. But half the kids in the country are non-smokers, like Pete McCabe. And the Surgeon General's records show that there are 18 million former smokers in the United States. The sad part is, it takes so long to get through. And the simple fact is that a lot of people are going to be disabled before they quit. They're going to be too ill to do the things they want to do in life. And some will die. You know, Judy, I think it'd be fine if I could uh, get on a good newspaper after I finish college. You mean around here? No, uh, New York, San Francisco, uh, some place where the action is. Oh. How do you know you'd like it if you've never been there? Well, gotta take a chance the future. We think about it and talk about it all the time. The future is always uncertain, and smoking makes it even more so. The doctors have said that cigarettes are out. But before we can end this old habit, we have to settle some old problems. Economic, communications, social problems, and personal problems too. But there's one thing that you can be sure of. 
the Surgeon General wasn't kidding. These public health people don't fool around. So everybody has to figure out for himself how he fits in. But you don't have to wait for public policy on this. With smoking, you can set a policy of your own.